Well, all right. Well, welcome to the class on researching deeds. Uh, I've got a slide up there now talking about why you would research deeds. Uh, I did want to point out, though, that this class is geared towards a, a case study in Loudoun County. So most of the reference I am going to give will be about Loudoun County. I've done research in other counties in Virginia, so most of my remarks will also apply to other places in Virginia. The only other state I've done research in is Maryland. I've done some research in Frederick County and in Charles County, Maryland. So uh, the deed records there seem to be similar to what I've been exposed to in Virginia. So uh, if you're in other states, I'm not sure how applicable this is. I think the general comments about deeds at the beginning will be, but when I get to specifics, they will vary somewhat. And I really don't have any experience in other states to speak to that. All right, why do we research deeds? Uh, the first point uh, bullet I have up there is did my ancestor own real estate? Obviously, most people are migrating from the East Coast in the United States, and before that in, in the colonial Virginia. And so people are moving west, and a lot of early... I don't think it's sharing your slides. I apologize. Um, wrinkles. Now I'm just starting your slides. Thank you. All right. <laughs> so a lot of people are coming into the uh, Americas and they're settling in Virginia and migrating west. So you may have, regardless of where you live in the United States today, you may have had ancestors that came through Virginia or came through Loudoun County. So you want to look through the counties on the East Coast to see if your ancestors are there. Uh, second point, who were my ancestors' parents and or brothers and sisters? Deeds can show you relationships between people. Typically, when land is owned, it passes to the next uh, inheritors after a person dies. You obviously could sell your land before you move west, but you may have a parent that stayed in Loudoun County while you moved west. And when your parent dies, you may inherit the property. And when there is an inheritance, then the wife's name would be on the deed if they sell it later and so would the children brothers and sisters so you may know the name of your ancestor from ohio and if you discover they had a father in loudon county who owned land then by going to the deeds here in loudon where they sell the property later you may discover the names of the other members of your family as well as your uh, ohio relative parents so that's, that's a good way from a genealogical standpoint to use deeds. Uh, who owned my property? A lot of people come into Vault's library to research the land that they own. We've got uh, over 400,000 people living in Loudoun County today. They don't own as quite a large parcels as they did back in the day, but there are a lot of people that live here and many of them want to research their property and find out what was there before they were and who owned it. And by doing deed research, you can do that. And where did someone live or a historical event occur? Uh, some people are doing research on slavery. Some people are doing research on the Civil War. Uh, I know I've done some research when they're dealing with plane crashes. So you want to find out where this event occurred or maybe where somebody well-known lived, you can go to the deeds and try to discover those type things. So, uh, one of the things with deeds, that it's not like the property is identified. You have to know the name of the owners. So that's what you want to do next. Now, let's see. Where do I click, Laura? Oh, well, it already went. All right. I'm on to my second slide now. These are some terms used in deed research. And the first one I made some reference to, chain of title. I'm going to have an example that I'll show you later, but that's a chronological record of ownership and references. Chain of title is not something you go down to the courthouse and discover. They don't have chains of title down there. Title examining firms keep records of, of uh, properties that they've researched a chain of title on. And if somebody comes along and uh, wants to buy the land again, if you go to the same title company, they already have researched the property and they'll pull their old file out and just continue to research from that point forward. 
but uh, the chain of title is a list of all of the transactions in the history of the property, and you have to create that. Uh, the next term I've got is grantor, persons giving property. In a lot of the counties, they have both a grantor and a grantee index, and you probably need to use both. But when I, for instance, I'm doing research right now in Warren County, and I use the grantee index initially to look for people who are buying property. I have a, main, a list of names from the tax records, and I'm trying to discover when they acquired the property. So I look their name up in the grantee index. And then if I discovered that who they bought the land from, one example I used in Warren County was the Marshall family. The Marshalls were considerable landowners in the Shenandoah Valley, and they were selling land. And this one family bought some land from the Marshalls. So then I went to the grantor index and looked up Marshall to see other people who may have bought land from the same family in the same neighborhood. And then the last thing I've got on this slide is meets and bounds. Meets and bounds is a description of the property giving direction and distance from each point. So that's what a surveyor does. The surveyor makes a record of the meets and bounds. And the distance is measured either in uh, poles historically, poles, a pole is 16 and a half feet, or chains, chain is four poles, so that's 66 feet, or in feet. And today, most of the references you see in surveys are by feet, but historically, when you look at the old deeds, they'll all, usually all be in poles, and at some point in time, they switch to chains. But those are all different ways of measuring distance, and obviously directions are a, a compass reading, so 90 degrees is the compass, and uh, you can have a line, let's say north 45 east is a compass direction, well, the same direction could be south 45 west, but I won't get into that too much today. I'm just trying to point out to you, and I'll show you a deed in a minute that actually has some of those references in it. I want to talk about parts of a deed, and again, this is something that will apply almost anywhere you go, regardless whether you're in Virginia or another state. Uh, you're going to have the deed as the beginning of the deed, which lists the date, the grantor's name, and the grantee's name. And that's referred to as the caption. And then next in the deed is consideration, which will be the value being given for the property. One of the common problems you run into with deed research is they refer to a lot of considerations as $10 and other good and valuable consideration. That's a common term used by lawyers. Uh, that means you don't know what they paid. The $10 is just a price, fair price given, so that shows it's a contract. The, the consideration makes it a legal contract. So most deeds today don't necessarily show you the value. If you're looking at a deed of trust, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, they actually state the value of the trust. If you're borrowing money on a property, that's a deed of trust. Uh, the next is the granting clause, intention of the owner to convey the property. So you need to know from the deed if there is a, uh, a granting of the property. Uh, we refer to that as bargain and sale. So they bargain and sale the property. Uh, next, I have description. I've got several descriptions written down there. Lot number 40 in Goose Creek Farms, uh, the Wallman Farm and Mercer District, or same as conveyed by deed book, or bounded by Limekill Road on the south or meets and bounds. So all of these descriptions could be used for the same property in different deeds. So I wanna point out to you that when you're chaining a piece of property, a title, you want to look at the description to see that the property you're looking at in the next deed is the same as the previous deed or the following deed if you're going forward in a chain. Because in chains of title, you can go either backwards or forward. They're designed to be gone backward. That's the way the title examiners work when they research property. They go from the current property back through the history of the property through the chain. And it's designed to be able to go backward. Because the next definition relates directly to that, the derivative clause. That's the grantor's source of title. So the grantor puts in their deed how they acquired the property. So when you're chaining property backwards, you look at the deed and you look for that derivation clause. 
And when you find that, our derivative clause, excuse me, when you find that, that'll tell you the deed reference of the previous deed. So then you just jump to the previous deed and you read the description and say, yes, it is the same property that was being conveyed. So it's, it's very easily designed to work backwards. Working forwards is a little more challenge, but you can do that as well. Uh, but the grander source of title might be deed book uh, 6B, and it might be will book such and such, and it'll say inherited from the, from the owner's uh, parents. So that's, that's what the clause does when you work backwards. But unfortunately, you'll discover that back in the earlier days, in the 1860s and 1840s, 50s, that a lot of those derivative clauses aren't added to the deeds. So when you're working backwards, you're going to probably hit what we call a brick wall. You're going to hit the place where it doesn't tell you where it came from, and, and I'll explain to you what to do then. And the last thing to look for in the deed is the signatures. And I mentioned earlier in that about the relationships. So when property is sold, everybody who's the owner of the property has to sign the deed. So if you have a husband and wife that own the property, both the husband and the wife's name will appear in the signature clause. So there's something that gives you the wife's name. When a husband buys a land, quite often the wife's name won't be stated in the grantee clause back in the old days. But when they sell the property, the wife has to sign the deed because she has what's known as a dower right, and I'll get into that a little bit later, but there's a dower right to the wife and a curtsy right to the husband. So the dower right, uh, if you, the woman doesn't sign it, she hasn't released her dower, and she could come back and place a claim against the buyers for her share of the property. All right. Uh, when, you, when you look in the deed index, and in each uh, circuit court clerk's office where these deeds are recorded, they'll have an index. And as I mentioned earlier, some of the courthouses uses two indexes, one for grantors and one for grantees. And if you're selling the property, you're the grantor, and you're buying it, you're the grantee. Uh, I'll skip down there to deed of trust. In the deed of trust situation, the grantor is the property owner, and the grantee is the person issuing the mortgage. So whoever's loaning the money on the property is the grantee. But then you, the first one on the top is bargain and sale, BNS. So in the, in the deed index, quite often they use these abbreviations. Loudon in particular has these. I've seen other abbreviations in other courts, but these are typically the references that they used. And Warren, where I'm working today, if it's a BNS, it doesn't say that, but if it's a deed of trust, it's written in the margin that it's a trust. So uh, typically bargain and sale is a transfer of ownership of property. And in the chain of title, that's what you're looking for because that changes ownership. A lease, you can lease land and particularly early in Virginia history, there's a lot of leases. There's still leases today, but leases were recorded when people didn't want to sell the land, they would just rent it to people. In some of the early properties, they were called manors. They had large tracts of land, and they would lease it out to people. The German settlement in Loudoun County was typical of that. Uh, then you can have an L&R, which is a lease and release. When I first started doing this research, I didn't quite understand what that was. You don't see it oh, after the 1800s. Usually in the 1700s, that reference is used. And basically what happened was they leased the property to a person, and then they released it. So it, in effect, is the same as a bargain and sale. So when you see L and R, that means they've actually transferred ownership to the property as well, just like a BNS. But again, that's not used today, but that was used in the 1700s. The deed of the trust or mortgage is very common today. A lot of people can't buy land unless they can borrow the money to get it. I always hear about people trying to have to arrange their financing when they buy their new property. If they don't have enough money to buy it, obviously they have to borrow the money. And so typically today you will see a bargain and sale deed recorded and immediately following that deed, you'll find a deed of trust. And let's say, for instance, the property sold for $600,000. If they had to pay $100,000 down, the deed of trust will be for 500,000. But you don't know from the deed of trust how much the actual bargain and sale was. You just know 
how much they're bargain, borrowing on the property, and it'll define the repayment clauses in there and the rights of the trustee to sell the property in the event that the grant t uh, the grantor the person uh, borrowing the money doesn't pay off the trust and then finally the division and i always like to look up those divisions because i i map property a lot and divisions have a plat in them usually and division is when property is divided usually between heirs uh, quite often a chantry suit will be filed by the heirs when somebody dies and they want to divide the property for instance, you may have a wife and five children. One of the children decides, I want to move to Ohio and I need my money. So they'll ask the property to be sold or divided so that they can sell their share of the property. So deed of division will have a plat in it. Most deeds do not contain plats. All right, but there are other ways to transfer property than deeds. And this is very important. When I do deed research at the courthouses, I'm always looking at the grantor and the grantee index, but there's many other ways to change the property ownership. Uh, for instance, I live on a piece of property that I inherited from my father in 1988 and from my mother in 2002. I inherited a one third interest in, from my father and I inherited the remaining to put me up to one half interest in 19 and 2002 when my mother passed away. The original deed to my father was in 1953. So there's never been a deed recorded on my property since 1953, although I've been the owner of at least a portion of it since 1988. Uh, marriage, uh, this is kind of a sexist comment here, uh, but uh, obviously in early history, it wasn't considered necessary for women to own property. You did have women that owned land, but typically when a woman got married, any property she owned was transferred to her husband. So when you look through the tax records and the man will be listed as the owner. I had an example I was researching out in uh, Falkier County, two fellows out there, I was looking up their deeds and I couldn't find them. And the property was on the borderline between Prince William and Falkier County. So I said, well, maybe the deed's over in Prince William. So I went over to Manassas and searched for the deeds and there wasn't any deed over there. Well, it turned out that these two men that owned property in the same area had married sisters and they had inherited the property through their wives. So their wives had gotten the, the property from her father. So there wasn't any deed recorded at all. It was just that the, the inheritance went through the daughters and the and then the husbands got it by virtue of having married the women. Uh, chancery is another way in which you'll see uh, property transferred. Uh, chancery suits are very interesting and very useful. I don't use any real examples of that today in my case study, but uh, they'll give you a lot of information on the family and also quite often may have an ad on the property and, and, and even have uh, uh, deeds of division within it with a plat in it that shows you where the property was. And sometimes the plats actually have buildings marked out on the plat. Typically, if uh, if there's a, a wife and several children, the wife dower is one third share and the children would divide the remaining part equally between them. So they would divide that five ways for the other two thirds. And uh, Usually it's divided in acreage, but it's really based upon value. So some land is more valuable than others, but so that when they divide the land, they try to equally. And sometimes in a in the division, they'll describe that one brother or sister owes more money to the other because they weren't equal in value. So they offset the value by making them pay one to the other. But the wife usually will get the one with the house on it. So the house will usually go to the wife. The wife will be living in the house and they don't want to evict her. So she'll be get the share with the house on it. Uh, then another way in which you would uh, transfer land is by tax sale. And the grantor in this case will usually be the sheriff. I don't see too many tax sales in my research. I think historically the governments didn't like to force people off their property for sale of tax. I think that's still true today. I was an auditor in my working days and rarely did local governments want to foreclose on people's property. Because the other thing, if they foreclose on a poor person, 
you know, the people would say, well, that wasn't fair. Well, if they foreclose on a rich person, the rich person will say, well, why didn't you foreclose on the poor person? So again, it's one of these things that they start foreclosing on property, they're almost required to do it uniformly to everybody who hasn't paid their taxes. And so most jurisdictions are very hesitant about selling property for taxes. And that was historically true as well. I have a list of uh, microfilm in the library here, and this again all relates to Loudoun County. Uh, I originally designed this presentation so that people would come to uh, Balt's library and try to do some of this research. Uh, when I do research on property, I usually want to go to the courthouse. The, the deed and will records are all maintained by the clerk of the circuit court. Each county in Virginia has a clerk and each city of first class, for instance, in this area, Alexandria is a first class city. Uh, Winchester is a first class city, but Falls Church and Fairfax City are not. Manassas and Manassas Park are not, so they don't have clerk's offices. But first class cities have clerk's offices and uh, all counties have clerk's office. And then the county maintains the records for the period of existence of that county. So Loudoun was created as a county in 1757. So Loudoun's records start in that year, 1757. Prior to that, Loudoun was part of Fairfax County. So if you're researching property in Loudoun and want to find the ownership prior to 1757, you're going to have to go to our parent county, which is Fairfax. Fairfax was created in 1742. And prior to Fairfax, we were part of Prince William County, which was created in 1731. Now, most of Loudoun wasn't settled till the 1720s. Uh, a little historical reference there, the Treaty of Albany was signed in 1722 between the Iroquois and the uh, 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 colonists. And prior to 1722 in the Treaty of Albany, this was Indian country. So there weren't too many white settlers in this area because even though the Indians didn't live on the, on the land, they, they believed it was theirs. And if they came down here in their hunting season and found some white people, they burned their house and murdered them. So uh, they would consider them trespassers. So, so that was the way they had been treated prior to 1722. But after that, the Indians agreed not to come east of the Blue Ridge Mountains and Loudoun became open for white settlement. So most of the settlement doesn't start till the 1720s. And the deed references again start in 1757 for Loudoun, previously in Fairfax and Prince William. So wherever you're doing research in Virginia, and that's true in other states, is that the county maintains records during their existence, but if the same area was settled previous to that, you may have to go to another county's records to find the information. Now, the microfilm we have here at the library for the deed index goes from 1757 to 1878. Uh, the deed books go from 1757 up to 1901. So we've got microfilm up to 1901 on the deeds, but you can't use the index to get to the later ones here at the library. You'd have to go down to the courthouse, but also the county has uh, uh, transcribed those records and they're on the clerk's website. So the indexes are on the clerk's website and can be accessed through the internet. The books themselves are not. They do sell uh, access to their deed records, which are, have all been scanned and are available online but you have to pay a, a monthly fee to get access to the records. I was told by a friend of mine that they had provided some free access during the coronavirus thing, but I think that's been discontinued all now. And so to use the records in Loudoun County or any other court courthouse, you have to go to the courthouse. This microfilm was filmed by the State Library in Virginia and they have copies of the microfilm. And if you're in another state, you can use interlibrary loan to get copies of the film where you live if you have a local library to go to and they'll loan it to the library from the Library of Virginia. Uh, next is the wills. The will index starts in 1757 as well and runs up to 1949. And the will books that they have filmed for are A through 2S, which is 18, 1757 to 1867, and will books 3A, 1875. You can see there's a gap in there through 3C, 1879. And then the land tax records, land tax records didn't start in Virginia until 1782. So there's no land tax records prior to 
1782, and another key date to remember is 1820. 1820 was the first year in which the tax records listed the value for the buildings. Prior to that, they just have a single value, both building and land together. You don't know if there's any buildings on the property or not, so there's no way to tell what the value of the buildings is prior to 1820. But starting 1820, they do, and the land records we have here at the library up through 1870 on microfilm. After that, she would go down to the courthouse in Leesburg and they have copies. Again, all this microfilm was filmed by the Library of Virginia, so all the information that's available on microfilm is available through the Library of Virginia. So if you're in Richmond doing research or you want to use interlibrary loan, they're all available that way. And I have some additional resources I've listed there, and I have those on the table here beside me. I don't know that you'll be able to see them. <laughs> My screen seems to be kind of small, but anyway, Marriages of Loudoun County. This is by Mary Alice Wirtz. There's another book on marriages in Virginia or Loudoun County that's been published. I like Mary Alice Wirtz's book, uh, but there is another there is another version of the Marriages of Loudoun County. Then the uh, index to Loudoun County, Virginia wills that was done by Louisa Skinner, Skinner Hutchison, who was a longtime employee at the clerk's office in Leesburg, Circuit Court Clerk's Office, and she did this book. And it's helpful because it lists uh, wills in which people are listed, so you can find relationships of people within there. Uh, and then the next thing I have is abstracts. Many of the people have done abstracts. This is uh, Ruth and Sam Sparacio, they've done abstracts of Loudoun County, and there are 20 volumes. This is volume 20 I brought as an example. They've they really cut off about 1800. Their abstracts only go from the early counties up to 1800. They've done abstracts of both Fairfax and Prince William. I know that are available in the library, and there may be some other counties in Northern Virginia that are available in vaults as well, but that's something that was published and available. And so that was a, a good thing if you're doing early research. And then the next one is my own publication. There's three volumes of this, Loudoun County, Virginia, 1860 land tax maps, three volumes. This is the volume on Tavner's district. In 1860, there were three districts in Loudoun. Uh, Thomas Wren was Eastern Loudoun. Jonah Tavner, who's my double great grandfather, was it's a family tradition, uh, was the assessor in Western and Southern Loudoun, Middleburg, Eunice, and that, all that area. And then the Northern part was George Fox's district. So there were three districts in 1860. And when you're researching property at that time, you would look in those three districts for each of your, for your ancestor. And more than likely, they're only gonna be in one of the three districts. After the, Civil War in 1870, there was a new constitution and it divided Loudoun County into six districts. So starting in 1870, the counties divided into six districts. I don't know if I can remember this off my head or not, so I won't try. But anyway, there that was divided in six districts. So again, when you're researching the property and you need to go to the land tax records, you're going to do that by district. And if you find the person is in a particular district, you will stick with that district. Early on in the, in the uh, 1700s, the districts are referred to by numbers, but later on they referred to them by the commissioner's name. So that's why I mentioned Wren, Tavner, and Fox, because those were the names of the districts. But it, it, sometimes they're just referred to District 1 or District 2, District 3, and at one time I think Loudoun only had two districts and later they switched to three. I don't know the year in which that happened, but, and again, in 1870, they switched to the magisterial districts and that was this, that case up until I think 1970 when we finally redistrict for the first time. Our population started to grow and we had to redistrict the county. And then finally, and I think Pat is with us today, I was told, is indexed to Latin County, Virginia land books, A through 4B. These were transcribed, I shouldn't say transcribed, were extracted by Pat Duncan, who lives out in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and that was an excellent job. And I tell people today that the one great thing about Pat's books, when you look people up in the index and they have several references, 
You don't want to, if, especially if you're using microfilm, you hate to pull out seven rolls of film to look up seven documents. If you can go to Pat's book and look it up, you can read her description and decide, is that the deed I want to look at? Is that probably the one that relates to the property I'm researching? Because people will buy multiple pieces of property. So by using Pat's book, you don't have to keep going through all the rolls of microfilm. And also, hers is a typed book as opposed to the handwritten things that you're going to find on the microfilm. Because again, most of the microfilm in the early research that you're probably going to be doing, it's all handwritten. So you may have some difficulty reading it. So Pat's book helps you greatly with that. So thank you, Pat, for all your great work. All right, we'll start with my chain of title. I'm going to point out a few things here. Let's see if I can figure out how to get this pointer going here. Maybe Laura's going to have to help. Oops, don't pull yourself apart there. All right, I think it went off, but we went away before. Oh, okay. It's right there. And then... oh, okay. All right. Again, I made this chain of title up. I was asking previous classes, how long did it take me to do this? This is only the one page. There's two pages of this. And I start with the top here from 1727. If I get my cursor to stop. <laughs> All right. That NNLG in the record number stands for Northern Neck Land Grant. It's book four, page 61. You won't find those in the clerk's office. The Northern Neck Land Grant, which Loudon was part of the Northern Neck, was all Lord Fairfax's proprietary. I'll say that's another class because I've taught a class here on Northern Neck Land Grants, but that was the first issuance to a white person of the property in Loudoun County. Lord Fairfax issued a grant to Robert Carter Jr. for 11,375 acres, referred to as the Goose, Goose Creek Tract. And the next one I have, I've got no record number on that, 1804. That's because that wasn't in Loudoun County. That wasn't recorded here. That was a division between the heirs of Robert Carter Jr. Well, actually, I guess it's Robert Counselor Carter is the son of Robert Carter Jr. So Robert Carter Jr. got the property, then his son inherited, and then his son had nine children, and he had them draw equal shares of their property. He owned land, multiple land in Virginia. These are all descendants of Robert King Carter, the richest man in Virginia in the colonial era. Anyway, Robert Counselor Carter, when he died in 1804, he divided his property in uh, nine shares to be divided to his children. And two, two sons, George Carter, uh, who will later be known as George Carter of Oatlands, and John Tashford Carter, who never lived in Loudoun County, they inherited shares of, of property that Counselor Carter owned in Loudoun County. And you can see that was quite a bit of land. Originally, the land grant was for 11,000 acres, but they, Carter still had over 5,000 acres of that left in 1804, almost 100 years later. In 1805, there was a deed to George, from George Carter to Edward Coe. And that's where the property we're going to start with. And I'm going to show you a copy of a, a page of that deed, 2F433. Now, I didn't explain the numbering system, so that LD, again, is just an abbreviation for Loudon, and DB means deed book. A little farther down, you'll see a WB, that's will book. Again, property can transfer by deed, but can also transfer by will. So the deeds, they started out numbering letter books. So you had A, B, C, D, and then when they got to the end of the alphabet, they switched to AA and BB, and later they referred to that as 2A and 2B, and then when they got through the alphabet the second time, they went to 3, and they kept using a number designation and a letter designation until uh, much later. You can see I've got just on this page in 1850, they're up to 5G, but uh, later on the county switched totally to a numerical system. I think the explanation I got from one of the clerks one time was the first numbered book is 388 because they went back and counted up all the books and they decided that 388 was would be the next numbered book. So 
from that point onward, all the books just have a number. There's no more letters used after that. And one of the oddities of history is J. There's no letter J used in the deed books, which is because the I and the J look too much alike. Has something happened to me here, Laura? I'm still online. I'm not sure about your audio. The camera seems to have decided to take a break. Excuse us if you can hear us. Few exciting things. So you should be able to pick up right where we are, and um, they can still hear us. Excellent. Um, so hopefully we'll have the video, here at some point. The video back in a second, but you continue on. All right. All right. Well, I was talking about uh, George Carter selling to Edward Coe in 1805, and I will have a screen on uh, showing that a portion of that deed. Oh, here, Nick only. <laughs> All right. After Edward Coe bought the property, he made several more purchases. So you can see those. Uh, 1807, 1808, 1811. In 1812, he sold eight and three quarters acres. Uh, I've not talked a whole lot about acreage, but uh, acreage can be divided in an acre is one acre of land can be divided into parts, and each part, a fourth of it, is called a rood, R O O D. In some of the deeds, they'll talk about how many acres, how many roods, and how many perches of land. I usually ignore the perches, but a, a, a rood is a quarter of acre. So Edward uh, Coe sold eight and three quarters acres. So that's eight acres and three roods. Anyway, uh, well, Edward Coe dies in 1815. And I've included an example of that. I'll show you that in a little bit. He died in his will. He actually went to the trouble to have the land surveyed and divided between his seven children. And so he had seven children and he gave them an equal share of the property, 122 acres. And he had already determined through a surveyor to divide the land and marked it off on, a, on the survey. I didn't find a plat for it, but I'll show you a plat of it a little bit later. But anyway, it turned out each child got 122 acres. So uh, what does they say? Do the math. So if you start with the 525, add the next three and subtract the eight and three quarters, it comes out to around 900 acres. So Edward Coe bought 525 from George Carter, but he added to that. And then he divided all of his land before he died in 1815. And we'll record that year. Uh, and then lastly was the 42 and three quarters down there says in trust that was a mill lot. He actually had a mill on his property and that would be the mill lot and it'll be recorded later. So if you if you added up the 122 seven times plus the 42, 75, you'll come out to about 900 acres. But then after that, what happens when these people divide the land? They aren't all going to stay here. Some of them are going to sell their land and move elsewhere. So you start seeing activity between the Coe family. So there's a deed in 1817 between Edward Coe's heirs, or Edward M. Coe is one of the children, and, and, and the other heirs, and they sell Robert Coe 82 and three quarters acres. Edward M. Coe sells his share to Coe's heirs, the multiple brothers and sisters. And there are a bunch of deeds there. So I want you to look down a little farther till you get down to near the bottom. In 1835, one of the Coes sells Robert Bentley 168 acres. And then the next year, Bentley gets 132 acres. And then he buys 121 and a half. And then he sells 22. Well, all of those deeds starting with the 168 down at the bottom. I'm not going to give you a math test today, but that all totals up to about 400 acres. So that's how much land Robert Bentley has accumulated by 1850. And if we go on to the next page,
didn't go on to the next page on my screen. <laughs> Time this morning. I'm going to try to plug in that People are being so patient and we appreciate them. Is that the next page? That is the next page. All right. And it looks like it's deciding to work on the camera. So hopefully. We well, it's up on my screen, so I hope it's up on yours. Hopefully we'll have smooth sailing. So anyway, by 1872, Robert Bentley dies. And his will leaves 400 acres. So that was the amount he'd accumulated to Anne S. Wildman, his daughter. Anne is his daughter. One of his daughters is married to Wildman. And then the Wildmans start accumulating a little more land. So John W. Wildman, I assume who's Anne's husband, Buys 97 acres in 1870. He buys 50 in 1880, and he buys 35 in 1881. And he buys some more land in 1887. And so by the year 1900, instead of the original 400, they now own about 600 acres, the Wildlands do. And Robert, B. Wildman and his siblings will sell to Catherine L. Wildman 600 acres. And I think if you add up all of the numbers above from 400 on down, you'll probably come up to around 600. And then uh, Katie L. Wildman, who's the same person as Catherine L. Wildman, gets 92 acres in 1905. So by then her total land is accumulated up to 692 acres. So in 1944, 692 acres is sold by Christine Wallman. I don't know if that's the same person as uh, Kat Catherine. I think it's probably not. It's probably a, a child, an heir of hers. The land is transferred to Mary Jo Epps. I, I wanna stop here and make a, uh, input here. None of this chain of title that I've done do I list deeds of trust. There are deeds of trust where people are borrowing money, but since deeds of trust don't change ownership, then I don't extract those information in my deed of uh, chain of title. Uh, I did have two other books here I was going to mention that I never did. These were some more detailed information on deeds. This is real estate. This is a Barnes and Noble thing about real estate that I got when I was having business law in college. So this dates back to my college days. And then this is called Title Examination in Virginia by Sidney Parham. And this, uh, this is 1965 that this was published. A friend of mine, uh, uh, I can't think of his name now. Anyway, Joe Rittenauer, who was an attorney in Leesburg, said he used this book when he was studying law in college. So these are, are longstanding things, and this is considered the definitive thing, but there's a heck of a lot more information in here than you're gonna need to do your historic research into deeds. But I wanted to point out that studying a real estate and title examination is a much more complicated process than what I'm gonna talk about today, but for historical research, you don't really need all that information. All right, now we're back to the 692 and the the uh, Epps come into the picture, and Christine Wallman sells it to Mary Jo Epps. Mary Jo sells it to Frank Epps, who I think is her husband. And then Frank and Margaret Epps sell to Robert and Christine Orr, and Robert and Christine Orr sell to Robert and Barbara Young. And I'm gonna show you a copy of the deed, which is from deed book 382, uh, page 72 for the 692 acres later. And then uh, the reason I use this example, I started out doing research on Oatlands and I started doing research on uh, my maps of Loudoun in 1860. But when I decided to do this class, I figured, well, I've got to bring this title on up and show you how to get through the process. So this 692 acres was divided in, in the late 1950s into a subdivision. You can see how this land started out with 11,000 acres.
Oops, sorry. So again, um, technical difficulties. Um, Wynn's going to continue with this slide while I get him back up and running. Um, thank you for your, for your patience. <laughs> All right, I talked about dividing the property. Now I switch to. I mean, usually we have hiccups, but not this many hiccups. So we were on uh, the second page, right? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> this is going to be the most exciting recording ever. All right, in the, in the late 1950s, they divide this property. And they say we started out with 11,000 acre grant from Lord Fairfax, and then it switched to where he sold off 525 to Edward Coe, then Coe added to that, and then he divided it amongst his children. And then the Bentleys came in the picture and bought land from the Coes and gathered up some more. So that's a typical example of what happens to real estate is that you start with large portions, it gets divided, then people come along and build it back up. And by uh, 19, late 1950s, the Youngs had over 300 or had 692 acres and they ended up deciding to subdivide it. So they subdivided and started selling off lots. And 1959, they sold off lots. You can see on the notes side, it says Goose Creek Farms lot number 40. And so there's four lots or four times that property sales up to 1984. And in 1984, some friends of mine, Zvi and Rena Glassman, I was on the Loudoun Library Foundation board with them. That's why I picked that, the, their property as the example to do on this. They're, 40 lots in there. I have another good friend that lives at uh, Goose Creek Farms as well, but I didn't use him as an example. I'm ready to go. My next slide. Oh. All right. This was this was uh, Latin Deed Book 2F433. And the reason I put this slide in here was because it has a plat in it. Most deeds don't have plats in them. Uh, and a plat is a drawing of the property. So this has actually a drawing of the property and you can see the streams. Goose Creek is down on the south side and North Fork that branches off is on the north side and then there's a straight line between the two. And off to the, to the left of those, you can see all of the meets and bounds calls from the survey. So the surveyor is actually giving you calls down the stream on both sides that you can build this plan out with. So that was that was in the deed book and this was from 1804 when Edward Coe acquired the original 525 acres. Okay, we're going to switch. Oh, the scenes. Because it, it really is better if you use this one. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's a bit misbehaved, so. Um, um. All right. She yeah. said I wasn't talking to you, so I was saying the plats on there, and then the calls are over here. So there's I get my cursor moving here. Wants to freeze up here, but anyway, there's one that says South 86 and three quarters East 22 poles. So that's one of the calls that goes along the stream beds. All right. I'm trying to get it to go to the next slide. How about if I use the arrow? There we go. 
So this is the uh, tax listing. This was from 19, uh, 2004. This was a page printed off the internet. The uh, county's assessments are on the website uh, maintained by the Commissioner of Revenue's office. It links in with the mapping site uh, maintained by the mapping office. And uh, anyway, this, you can see a little icon up the top says map it. So actually at the time, if this was a live site, I could click on the map it and it would bring up a map of the property. And I'm gonna show you a map in just a second. But you can see that it gave you the deed book reference down there under recent sales, deed book and page. That was 1984. Deed book 8461174. So on the chain of title, that should be the deed to the Glassmans. And the Glassmans are listed as the owners up above. Now, all the property in Loudoun today is available on this assessment site. You'll see assessment site. Obviously, you're not going to be able to find 2004 assessment, but you'll be able to find the current assessment and get the deed reference off of that. So that's why I've got this here for you. Now, this was something I printed from the county's mapping page, and it was showing all the parcels divided. So I wanted to point out, I think I can get my pointer going here again. So, yeah, there it is. It's out there. So you can see this is Goose Creek right here, and this is North Fork coming right up here. So these all these pieces have been divided. These are part, all parts of those 40 pieces of the Goose Creek Farms. And the one that the Glassman's own is the one that's red on the top of the map. So this shows you where the relative location. This road here is a road shown here. That's Lime Kill Road today, if you don't know Loudoun County, but that goes along Goose Creek. All right. And then this is just a larger magnification of the property. Now, the county's mapping system used what they call a pin number for parcels. So each parcel has its own pin number, and if you click on the parcel on the mapping side, it brings the pin number up. And so the pin number for this parcel is 4261009488. And I don't think that's going to mean much to you, but the first three digits are from the tax map grid. So historically, the county divided the property, uh, divided the county into a grid map. And the grids were numbered consecutively, so that was that's the grid number. It's four two six, and then the rest of that is the parcel number. And I think they explained to me one time about the the grid map, the upper portion or lower portion. It's numbered a certain way, so that means something to them, but it doesn't mean anything to me. So, and then this is another plat from the deed book. This is deed book. 388, 395, and shows a plat of that 10 acres, 10 and a half acres when it was first divided as lot 40. So you can see how very similar that is. Oh, well, I didn't have to go back to you there. You can see how the shape of that is exactly the same as, as the plat in the deed book. So they use the plats in the deed book to create the maps on the mapping site on the handbook plat. Now, this was an old site for the county. I talked about them being online. If you go down to the courthouse today, you can actually search documents and you can click on the boxes. So they've got uh, the ones they use here are the, I think the cross-reference and the instrument album you're going to search. You use this, these boxes to search. Since I'm not online, clicking on anything wouldn't serve any purpose. But I wanted to show you what the screens look like. So this is... Welcome to the Loudoun County Public Access System. The clerk has this, and in most clerk's offices today, they're automated. So they've scanned the documents, so you're going to have some type of input screen if you're at the clerk's to search. I prefer using the old deed books and pulling them out and looking through the indexes, but you can search using the indexes on here by inputting information. Here's a search screen that you go on. Uh, this was a, a, a later version of the updates. I'm not sure their screen looks exactly the same today. I didn't check it out before I gave you a presentation today. But you would enter the organization's name up there and you'd search. And then you see you got various boxes up above archives. If you're looking for the old deed books, you usually go into archives. And I think the next screen refers to that. No, maybe it doesn't. All right. So the, there's where you're entering document information. And book and page. 
So if you had a book and page reference, you can actually enter it here and then ask it to display the book and page. Yeah, there's, this is the archive page here. So if you're going back to old things, you see the pull down menus there in the left of the layer for the pull down. If you click on that book and page there, it'll actually give you a list of the books that they have. So you can just page down or you can just type in the number. It'll work either way. Sometimes these things are easier if you put, use the pull down menu and select from that. And I mentioned earlier about the will in 1815 by Edward Coe. This is a software program that I have that you will probably won't have access to. But uh, when Edward Coe divided his land, which was about 900 acres into seven parcels that he divided to his children, they all had the meets and bounds surveys in the in the wheel book. And I planted those out using this software called Deed Mapper. This is my North Fork uh, project, item number five, Edward Coe to Robert Coe, 97 and a half acres, which is uh, this piece right up here, it says Robert Coe on that. I've just displayed the owner's names with this one I printed out here. On my computer, it would have highlighted this one, but that's the 97 right there. And this is the 42.75 acres where the mill site is. So this is known as Coe's Mill. I like Robert Coe because he's one of my people, as I say. I'm the treasurer of Mount Zion Cemetery down near Gilbert's Corner. And Robert Coe is buried there. So he's one of my people because he's buried in my cemetery. But anyway, <laughs> uh, when you're a genealogist, you people that you research become your people. I'm sure Pat thinks the people that she researches is that way. Anyway, you can see here, this is where Goose Creek is right down here at the edge here. And this is where North Fork is up on this side. So that's that original 525 acres that that uh, Edward Coe purchased. And I'm not sure whether this line is the, the original dividing line or whether it's this, it's this line over here. But anyway, this is, that, this is that 525 acres that Edward Coe bought from George Carter. And so I had never seen this before in a plat or in a will book that the, the, the person had actually bothered to divide the property amongst their heirs. Usually you will have a chancery suit and the chancery as commissioners, they'll appoint commissioners and the commissioners will go through the process of dividing the land. But this was actually done by the, the um, man who died, Edward Coe, and he divided the land amongst his children. So all those people are, I think there's a Smith up here, that Smith girl was a Coe before she married Mr. Smith. But most of these people are Coe's. I think he had quite a few sons. Oh, there's one, I think that's, yeah, Menon, E. M -A -N. But anyway, I won't dwell too much on this, but I wanted to show you that what they did in that division created all these plots and all of these people had ownership of theirs, but they had the right to sell theirs to their brothers and sisters or anybody else they wanted to. So, so it, it did become very complicated that the 900 acres owned by Edward Coe was divided amongst all these children. Now, this is the deed I talked about with the Youngs, all right? And if you look at the top of this, this is deed book 382, page 72. You can see it's got the date between Robert Orr and Christine Orr, his wife. So they're the grantors. And Robert B. Young and Barbara F. Young, his wife, they're the grantees. So that's the caption causes this paragraph right here, witness that for the consideration of $10 and other good and valuable consideration, see, it doesn't state what, how much they're paying. It just gives you that legalistic term that makes it a contract. And here's the intent, the conveyance, do hereby bargain, sell, grant, and convey with general warranty of title and a fee simple unto the said Robert B. Young and Barbara B. Young. So there's the conveyance thing. And they have the right of survivorship at common law. Again, if, if Robert dies, Barbara automatically becomes the owner, or if Barbara dies, Robert becomes the full owner of the property. So they both own the property now, and if they sell it now, they both have to sign the deed. 
but if they sell it later, after one of them is deceased, the other one automatically gets ownership. That's what the right of survivorship is. Uh, and then it tells you that it's, uh, let's see, all those three parcels, adjacent and contiguous, in the aggregate 692 acres, more or less. Uh, one of the things about real estate law is they put this clause more or less in there. So that if you paid uh, $692,000 for the land, let's say, and it turned out to be two acres more, they wouldn't owe you another $2,000. And if it was only 690 acres, you, you wouldn't have to pay them back 2,000. So that means that regardless of whatever the acreage is, is this is this is a deed for the property, not for the per acre price. And it's situated line and being shown about five miles from Oakland's on the road leading to Mountville, that's Limekill Road, in Mercer Magisterial District. And the deeds are usually going to state what district it's in at this time. After 1870s, when they're selling the land, they usually do state what district the property is in. And that certain tract of land known as the Wildman Farm, when I was talking to you earlier about the description, they've got the aggregate acres up there, 692, but they refer to it as the Wildman Farm and tell you who the adjoiners are, formerly owned by Welch Fur, blah, 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 the Utopia Farm and others. Oh yeah, bounded by the lands now, so that less, however, 34. So it, it can get rather complicated, but again, what you're trying to do when you do deed research is see if the deed you're looking at is the property that you're trying to chain the title for. Because sometimes they'll sell a portion of it off, Sometimes it will be another whole tract that has nothing to do with because you're following the names when you're doing the research in the deed index. This is the second part of the deed, that certain tract of land, you know. The aforesaid lands are conveyed in gross and not by the acre. So again, that's about this more or less. And I don't know if I have the prior site to, yeah, here we go, some of the prior site, the derivative part, I talked about it. Yeah, by deed from Frank Epps to Margaret Epps, his wife, bearing date the 29th of October, 1952, a record in the clerk's office aforesaid in liver, meaning book, liver is another term for book, 13Y folio, and that's page 305, which said deed and references contained herein. I have to look back to my deed, see if I got that. Yeah, 13Y 305, it's on my chain of title. So, so that, that if you're working backwards, that reference would have helped you get there. If you're working forwards, that's no lead to where you go next. Uh, this is a page from the tax book. Again, I tried to use examples that were printed out so you didn't have to use handwritten information, but also some of the later tax books actually had the deed reference numbers in them. So here's the Youngs listed with their land. They lived in Sterling, but this property is not in Sterling. This is part of uh, Mercer District. See, it says right there, Mercer District, and that's what the deed said, it was in Mercer District. And it says their acquisition was deed book 38272. So that was where they acquired it, and it has in three parcels. I tried to add these up last night when I was making sure I was ready to do this class, and it's like, well, that doesn't add up to 692. I don't know what they did, but they said less 34 acres. So I won't try to figure out the numbers. Sometimes it's confusing when you're trying to match the numbers up, but th that's the parcels that they bought that are in Mercer District. And these are the old tax map numbers instead of that uh, 426 that I had for the pin number there. Yeah, these are 73, 74, excuse me, 75, 74, and 74. So those were the deed book, uh, deed uh, map references from the earlier map system that the county used, and later they switched to the grid maps with the higher numbers because it went up to 400. And then this is a copy from the deed index, and I talked about that numerous times, but I had this because down here, Edward Coe from George Carter, B and S, and I think that says 2F. 433, which should be the one on the deed map for the 525. The, the amount of acreage is not stated here. It does tell you it's a BNS, 
and see these sprawling tubes in Loudon, they weren't using a grantor grantee index book at this time. It's all together in one book. So they use this column to tell you whether who's the grantee and who's the grantor. So in this situation, George Carter is the grantor, Edward Coe is the grantee, but up here where this Jacob Wildman is and this Catesby Cock, Wildman over here is the grantee and Cock, Catesby uh, Cock is a grantor. So, and see there's the effort, reference to the L and R and the lease. So you can see those references are in the deed book index that I talked about. This P of A is power of attorney. That really is not gonna relate to any change in value, but you can sign, once you've got the power of attorney, you can sign deeds for someone else. So you may find if a person has a power of attorney that they're the one that's the grantor because they've been given the power of attorney. But it, it's really a, a guessing game with the clerks. If, if, if somebody appointed a power of attorney, the clerk may consider them the grantor or they may actually consider the person who owned the property the grantor. So you're never sure sometimes when there's a, a legal relationship there, whose name is gonna be in the index. Just like I said, some usually you can have a tax sale and have the sheriff's name listed as the grantor, but it may actually be the person that owned the property. They're not selling it, but they did own it. And if that's what you're trying to follow, it would help us in our research if it had it that way, but you, you really have to figure out which way the clerk does things. And then I add, this is my final slide. Uh, it said in my class description that I was gonna to talk to you about uh, Chantry's cases and, uh, and uh, newspaper advertisements. This advertisement is in a case involving Rogers versus Simpson, uh, Chantry case number M1514. And if you read the little ad, you can see it's an ad that appeared in the paper, public sale, in pursuance to a decree of the Circuit Court, Circuit Superior Court of Law and Chantry for Lamb County, 1835, in the cause of you, Rogers, and others against John Simpson and others. I offer for sale before the courthouse in Leesburg, 16th day of December, 1835, to the highest bidder the several tracts of parcels of land lying in Loudoun County in the neighborhood of Coe's Mill, which Edward Coe deceased, devised to his sons. So at least some of those parcels from that will book have now ended up in this chantry suit. But again, I was only following the part over there where this 10 acres that the Glassman's acquired. So some of those other pieces of land that are in that extended piece that goes north I don't know if I want to go back to the plat. I have to page to quite a few pages to get back to it. But where I did that division on the deed mapper, there was lots of property, and this is part of those parcels that are being sold in this chantry suit. So this was a, a related to the property, but not directly related to the 10 acres that I was following. And that's my last slide. So I hope you have a few questions to address and that the mechanics continue to work. Right. Thank you very much, Lynn, for your uh, um, for your your characters and your patience under fire and this excellent presentation. We have several comments already about how helpful this information is. So um if you have questions that you haven't put in the chat box, um, go ahead and we'll just, um, if you want to stop, we'll stop sharing your screen so people can see your smile again. Oh, you're going to make me a big screen. Yeah, I go. So you are actually a big screen. Great. So a couple questions that came in um, throughout the presentation. Uh, first question uh, that somebody had. Um, related to your land tax maps. Okay. You mentioned several great books and Pat Duncan, thank you for the plug. Uh, but someone was asking, are your land tax map volumes available for sale? The answer is a definitive no. I have a good friend named Taylor Chamberlain. He said, why don't you publish these things? And at one time, the Wrens District, which is Eastern Loudon, was published in a, in a magazine called Northern Virginia 
genealogy that was published by Marty Hyatt that's no longer published, and I don't know that you can get them anywhere, but the library has copies of it here. But the, the land tax maps were for that one district. But I told my friend Taylor Chamberlain, I said, well, I don't want to publish these books because that'll force people to come to Leesburg to the Thomas Balch Library and use the library. <laughs> we so so uh, I've never published the books except for the ones that Marty published for Wren's district. All the rest have not been published at all. And the only place that you can access them for Loudon is at Thomas Balch Library. I have done some other counties. I've done tax maps for Prince William County, just the Northern district. Uh, where Manassas is, and that's in the Bull Run Regional Library in Manassas. And I've also done Falkier County, uh, the upper parts of Falkier County that are available at the Gott Library in Marshall. And in recent months, I've been working on uh, Clark County and Warren County, but none of that is available to the public right now. So I, I, I don't have any plans to do any publication of the tax maps. As I say, I prefer these locations that house the maps to draw people to those locations and use those facilities. I'm trying to support the libraries, which I think is very important. We are happy to help people <laughs> access your land tax maps. Um, we also have um, copies of the Fauquier County map. You were yes, yes. and shared that with us in a lovely thing binder. <laughs> I donate that in memory of Mary Fishback, who many of y'all probably knew. Mm -hmm. Very pleased to have it. So a couple questions about um, plats that you talked about. Um, so if a deed does not have a plat, is a plat still available somewhere? Is there any way to know? Uh, typically, very few deeds have plats. Uh, today, they have what's known as plat books that they have where they're hanging plats in the, in the clerk's offices, and they have indexes for those. But historically, when there were plats attached to a deed that were recorded, they were in the deed book with the deed. Once in a while, and I noticed in Fauquier County in particular, many of these division plats were recorded in the will book. So the will book has some plats in it. When I worked in Clark County recently, I found two nice plats in, in the will books, but it's rather rare to find them, to my experience, in the will books. Most of them are in the deeds, and they're under that index for division. So. If you're looking for a plat, sometimes just look, go through that person's name in the index, and if you see one that says division, then those are ones to look up to see. But the deed mapper example I showed you, that's that's what I do a lot, and that's how these tax map books I created come from, and that I've created the plats using software from the calls in the book. But historically, mapping didn't start. I was told in Loudoun County there wasn't any mapping of the counties using these grid maps until about 1960. That prior to that, all the tax listings are just alphabetical listings as the person's name, how many acres they own, and a general description as to the location. And when I say general, it might say it was on Goose Creek. And if it said on Goose Creek in Loudoun County, well, Goose Creek runs from the southern end of the county with Falkier County up to the northern end where it flows into the Potomac River. So on Goose Creek could be <laughs> almost anywhere in the county. So those type descriptions aren't always very helpful. The other thing in the tax list, though, for locating property is it gives you a reference from the courthouse. So it might be northwest 12 miles from the courthouse, and you can actually take a measuring thing on a map and try to figure out how far that is in general vicinity they're in. Uh, one thing I didn't talk about, because I wasn't really talking about mapping, I was talking about research of properties, but like for instance, in Loudoun County, there's an 1853 Yardley Taylor map that they have on display upstairs, and it has people's names cited on there. And when I did my 1860 maps, I relied on that heavily to help me identify where people's property was. It doesn't have boundaries on the map, but it does have the name of the person written in where they property ownership was, but they had to pay to get their name on the map. And some people were a little too frugal to do that, didn't realize that posterity would leave them out if they didn't put their name on the map. So not everybody who owns land allowed is included on the yard of Taylor map. Well, of course, Taylor was a surveyor, so he had yes. a pretty good idea of where people's property yes. was, hopefully. <laughs> Great, uh, one follow-up question about plus, I think you kind of alluded to, um, at some point in history, did, uh, did having a plat become required 
for uh, a like a legal requirement? The the only uh, when I talk about that 1950 division of the Goose Creek Farms today, if you subdivide property, if you're a developer and you're going to build lots, or you're just a property owner and want to divide your property amongst your children, you have to record a plaque. That's required, but that was required with the zoning laws and that all didn't start till the 1960s. So today you would have to record a plat, but not for a deed. You can record a deed. And, and one of the things that is very frustrating sometimes in doing research, people will sell a deed without any real clear description of the property. And they'll just say, I'm selling this parcel, a piece or parcel of land of which I own without any description saying how many acres it is, where it's located or who I got it from. It's still a legal document without any firm description. And I've always been frustrated too with the commissioners in Chantry. When they sell a property off from a Chantry suit, rarely do they put any kind of good description in the deed. When they sell the deed, they give you a very plain description of the property. And you'd think the court's paying them to do this. They do a better job, but they just don't. They don't give you much description at all. They just say, this is property from this suit. Uh, quite often you can go to a chantry suit and there'll be a plat within the suit. And that was again, somebody asked about plats. Quite often, sometimes you can find plats and chantry suits. And one thing that's very helpful today is the Library of Virginia has scanned most of the chantry suits in Virginia and they're available online at the Library of Virginia. And you bring up the county you want type in the name and it brings up the cases that has that person's name in it. There's also a box that says plat. And when you open up that case, you click on that plat button and it jumps right to. So there may be 300 pages in that scanned in that file, but it, it allows you to jump right to the plat. So if there is a plat within a chantry suit, you can find those. And actually I go to some of the counties and search by plat. So I put in the county name and I'll say plat and it'll list all the cases that have a plat in them. And I'll say, okay, I'll go through the names and see if there's any I'm interested in. And I'll click on those and look at the plats. Okay. Um, we have a lot of questions and some advice. <laughs> so, we also all right. good. Um, so if you're good, we'll keep going. Um, combining a couple of different questions, we have a lot of people who are new to this and they're, they're excited to get started. Um, so do you have, what's the, Good advice you have for a newbie to get started researching. Um, where do you start? Do you start here at the Balch? Do you start at the courthouse? What say say you were researching um, a family farm that, or a farm that you just purchased? Um, where would you go? All right, I would say the first thing again back to the first screen I had. Why are you doing this? What are you trying to learn? But now the specific example, if you have acquired property and you want to research that. The first thing I would do would be go to the county's assessment site and get the most recent deed reference. And that'll be on that site, just like I showed you with the Glassman's, it actually lists the deed number, book and page, when it was acquired and tells you how many acres it is. So whether it's your property or your next door neighbor's property or just somebody who you're curious about, you can get that information off the assessment site for the county. And that's where I'd start to work backwards and then you're gonna to have to probably go to the courthouse, again, back to Balls. They've got records here pre-1900 on microfilm, but post-1900, they don't have anything. So you're gonna to have to go to the courthouse to look those up, unless you want to pay what, $300 a month or something to get online access, then they, the clerk may put you online and then you can research at home. But, but other than that alternative, I would say you're probably gonna to head to the courthouse. And I think the courthouse in Leesburg is open from 8 to 4. Most days. Most days, sorry. They're very helpful. Mo Monday through Friday, yes. They're very helpful. Whereas, whereas Balls Library has evening hours and uh, weekend hours. So mm -hmm. if, you were, if you were a person that had a regular job and couldn't get to the courthouse from 8 to 4 on Monday through Friday, coming to Balls and using the microfilm here is an alternative once you get back to about 1900. Um, and we, if you call us and ask us often, we will tell you that exactly. <laughs> but you need to there, there is an alternative of hiring somebody to do the research for you. And I would suggest that if you lived in Kansas or maybe 
Uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, maybe hiring somebody else to do the work for you might be easier because I always say when you go to some place that you're not familiar with, you waste a lot of time just getting familiar with where to go and how to get there and where to park and things like that. So uh, for, for I, I paid a researcher one time to do some deed research for me up in uh, Ohio, West Virginia, which was, uh, uh, I think, uh, no, yeah, it's Ohio County, which is where Wheeling, West Virginia is. So I thought I thought it was worth the money. I, thought, I said, by the time I got up there and got a hotel room, I'd spend several hundred dollars and I'd rather spend the money paying somebody to do the research for me than waste all that time myself. But anyway. And I think it helps it, if somebody's familiar with the records, they can give right. you advice too and yes. about where to go. Okay, well, Pat Duncan had some advice and we've mentioned her. Okay. Um, she says that you might want to mention that the early land tax lists give information about those who leased land. It, it won't give the location, but at least verifies the person leased land and identifies the acreage. So that could be helpful. Yes, yeah, so Pat is very correct in that. Uh, one of the, the projects I was working on one time was with a friend named Dave Smarr from out of Missouri. And Dave did a very excellent book on his family. And they had early lease in the uh, Goose Creek trip. And uh, I had, I'm of the strong opinion that a number of leases were never recorded in the deed books. And that's another problem with leases is that quite often they weren't always recorded. So, uh, but the, when you go to the tax records, what the early lease people did, they required the person leasing the land to pay the taxes. So like George Carter owns thousands of acres and he's leasing it out and maybe he's got 30 tenants that is leasing land to, they're all listed under his name in the tax list. In the alphabetical listing, you go to C and find George Carter and then under his name is all these people and in most cases, they had 300 acres or less, but they're listed with how many acres they had. Uh, the problem I had at the time was I knew George Carter owned multiple, well, not George, Robert Carter, owned multiple land. They had the frying pan track down near Herndon. They had the bull run track that's Prince William County and extends over to Loudon. And then they had the Goose Creek track. And I said, well, I don't know if these leasers, which track the people are on, but my friend Dave Smarr, said, yes, they are grouped together by which parcel they owned lease property in. So again, Dave was able to figure that out. I, I looked at it and I said, oh, forget this, this is too complicated, but, but Dave was able to piece that out because he was trying to identify his ancestors at, at uh, Oakland's. And he's produced two books, I think now, that are really, really, really very detailed. Well, I think he's actually got the third book out now. I think he's got three, so. Excellent. Okay, so on to some more specific questions. All right. Uh, we have a question. Does Virginia have division of property deeds or records for enslaved people who are divided among heirs? Do you know anything about? Uh, in, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll use uh, Falkir properly. In Falkir, in the deed book, there's an inset, uh, uh, index. I think it's of Negroes, I think. I think was the term they used but it also relates to slaves. And they actually had an index in the book that you could go to the deed index and look up the word Negro. And I may be wrong, it may be slave, but I think it was Negro. And it'll have every deed that has a reference to a Negro in it, which includes the slaves. And when you divide property in a family, uh, my uh, the Saffers owned slaves in Loudoun County in 1844, they had a chantry suit where they fought over the slaves and the commissioner divided the slaves amongst the heirs. So if there is a division of slaves, and quite often in wills, people will specify slaves going to someone. But if you're the black person trying to find your ancestor, unless you know the owner's name, that's not going to do you any good. And I, I don't know that there's any... Uh, uh, overall index to help you find these documents. So again, going back to the research, you, it, it's going to help you to figure out where they were enslaved if you're trying to find a slave. If you're just trying to find out whether your ancestors who owned slaves, who they were and how they were divided, you might find that in a will book uh, where they're actually dividing them. In the deeds, you don't tend to find a whole lot 
But uh, my friend Lori Kimball and I did a research project on uh, James Monroe at Oak Hill, and uh, he was quite often mortgaging his slaves. So some of the deeds of trust list the slaves by name because they're being put up as collateral for money that he's borrowing. So deed to trust would have had them had yeah. could potentially have the slaves name in them as well. Yeah. Okay. Um so we, we actually have a couple of people who although your your case study sort of started with with this focus on Lyle County, which is excellent. Um they're working on projects that cross multiple counties in Virginia. For instance, we have a person who's researching a Richmond, Virginia slaveholder who moved to Alabama. She wants to find records of him prior to when he moved. And then she also has someone in Charles City, Virginia, who she's trying to locate records on. Um, we also have some people from Glasgow County and some other places. They're curious about how to get started with that research. They said your presentation is very helpful. Do you have advice? And I know you mentioned the Library of Virginia and that they have record sets on microfilm. Do you have advice for people who are looking for information across counties, like or in several different locations, where to go to get started? Well, I think I think number one, you probably should start with a map of Virginia so you have a sense of where the counties are. And then you need to figure out the timing of these counties' creation. Uh, one book I use is the Horn Book of Virginia History, which I know the library has, and it tells you when different counties were formed and what they were formed from. So, again, you, you want to deal with the time of history you're dealing with. So, let's say, obviously, you're dealing with slavery, but let's say 1844, you're focusing on somebody at that point in time. You know, what, what potential counties existed, where they are, they, maybe those county names have changed since then or they were different ones in 1740. And so you want to try to figure out exactly what counties potentially you should look at. And then you could narrow your search down to searching for names in those counties. So, and again, uh, as Laura pointed out, the Library of Virginia has all the counties. You know, it, it'd be a terrible thing to get in your car and drive 300 miles and discover that the county you're in isn't even the place you want to be. And at that point, not even know what county to go to. But by, by using the Library of Virginia, you can jump from one county to the other without distance traveling, because yeah. it's all there. And again, back to my point earlier about the interlibrary loans, that is an excellent resource, because I think here in the Baltz, you pay $5 for an interlibrary loan. If you get a roll of microfilm and there's nothing on there that's helpful to you, it only costs you $5, you know, and it was, Ship to your local library. So, so that is a very good way to start if you're going to do this. I also have to add that the turnaround time for interlibrary loans is a lot quicker than you think it would be. <laughs> it, it usually is a week, maybe two weeks tops um, to get that film. I mean, I used to roll a film here at the library and Laura ordered the wrong film. It did. And it did, she didn't even charge me $5 for the one. She did get the right one. Yeah, so. that was, I think the buck. <laughs> that was my mistake. I was like, these are not the right tax records, but we'll see. So I think she ordered, I was looking for the real estate records and she ordered the personal property. So mm -hmm. usually we order the right film. <laughs> Sometimes we don't. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up, Wayne. All right. Okay, well, thank you. I think that's very helpful. Um, and they also have guides to counties with lost records, so burnt records, yes. things like that. So that's helpful to know. If yeah, I don't, I don't know if all of y'all out there understand what a burned county is, but a burned county just means there's a gap in the records. Loudoun County has all of their records. They haven't lost any records historically. But if a courthouse burns down, you lose records. In the Civil War, some records were taken out of the courthouse. The courthouse weren't burned, but they still refer to those burned counties. Prince William is the only county I've done research in that is considered a burned county. And I was very frustrated by the fact that some of the deeds I was looking for, that the deed book no longer exists, nor do the index books in some cases exist. So they're missing books that you just can't find the documents you want in these burned counties. And so if you, if you are doing research and you uh, discover that the county you're going to do the research in is one of these burned counties in the library of Virginia will have a list of those. Uh, yeah, you're going to have a challenge there for sure. All right. Well, 
are, I think we have, um, if anybody has any questions out there still, uh, please put them in, but we have one last question. Well, maybe they're typing. Um, so if someone has a deed from 1830 that the consideration is $1, um, would you infer from that that this is likely a relative? So they... uh, no, I would not infer that. Uh, usually the, the other term that they use of is a deed of gift. It'll say for love and affection is the term they used. That's a deed of gift. It, again, if there's a dollar in there versus this ten dollar thing, it's still that's what makes it a legal contract. So, the dollar might be a uh, what we call not an arm's length transaction, maybe a friend or a relative that you're transferring property to. But I wouldn't necessarily assume that from the document. Okay, that's that's helpful. Because I always wonder that with um, other weird considerations, like an ear of corn or a mustard seed, you know, it, are they related or they just have a... Well, uh, we didn't talk extensively about Northern Neck land grants, but uh, but they put the, the Lord Fairfax, when he granted land to you, you had to pay an annual quit rent. That's Q-U-I-T, quit rent. And it was measured in peppercorns. Now, I don't totally understand the concept there, but anyway, they, you had to pay it in so many peppercorns. Now, I do understand the concept that way back in the beginning of Virginia that they paid their taxes in tobacco. And that was a problem because the price of tobacco was varying. It would go highs and lows. And if so, if tobacco prices were low, the government was losing out if you were paying your taxes in the back and if the prices were high, you were losing out because you were paying more than the fair price for the back. Oh, yeah. So okay. Um so one more question. Oh actually I missed it. Um just since we're talking a little bit about early uh records, how much of the Fairfax records prior to Loudoun County's formation are available? And they asked where, but those would be the Fairfax County Courthouse, right? Yes, they'd be available at the Fairfax County Courthouse. One of the interesting experiences I've run into in researching is the urbanized areas of the state have grown rapidly like Loudoun and Fairfax. And they've tended to create an archive section. So Loudoun has an archive section and Fairfax has an archive section. The records are much easier, easier to access where these archives exist. And you also usually have an archivist that works at the clerk's office who's familiar with the old records. If you go to a place that's still recording deeds and don't have an archive section, and you're asking about the old records, they don't know anything about it. It's like, don't ask me, I don't know what they did in 1862. You know, it's like, they they don't have the understanding nor the appreciation because that's not the main thing they do. Whereas in these, as I say, in these urban growth areas like Loudon, Prince William does not have an archives, unfortunately, but but most of the fast growing counties will will set aside their old records and create a separate section that they call the archives. And that's much more help to uh, researchers when you have that situation. Whereas the rest of the time, the people that are paying the money, which is the lawyers and the title examiners, they're they're the people that that the clerk's office is catering to, as opposed to us researchers of history. Yeah, yeah, and, I, and the state of Virginia has records retention policies, but they don't right. dictate what each county does in order to to manage their records. So we do have two two more. Um, more, more. One is a comment. One is a question. Um, so Pat Duncan uh, mentions that you might want to mention using the order in minute books, which sometimes give information about relationships, etc. I mean, uh, that might be in relation to that earlier consideration question. I haven't used much of the order in minute books, Pat. Uh, the the clerk of the circuit court, which exists in each county, and as I said, first class cities. Historically, the clerk was also the clerk of the justices of the court, the court justice, and also clerk for the Board of Supervisors later on. 
So they kept the minutes of those meetings and they do enter things in there. So when they record a deed, it's entered in the order book that they recorded deeds. So it's an entrance, but but again, my experience is using the index of the minute books is not very easy. It's very cumbersome to use, it's very difficult to use. And so if you wanna just scan through the books, that's one thing. Uh, Louisa Hutchison did a book on uh, Loudoun County, uh, what's it, Bastards and Poor Children or something Bastards like that? Bastards and Poor Children, it's one yes. of her titles. And anyway, Louisa's book, she went through and extracted all this. It would have been very difficult for you or I as a researcher to get the information that she put in a book form. So I, back to one of the things Pat did, she indexed some order books for the county. And so, yeah, where there's been a new index created, it's very helpful, but if you're using the original index, and I've seen some of the order books that don't even have an index in them. So so you go one index book and the very next one might not have an index in it. And, and, and the way that they index varies from clerk to clerk. So if the clerk changed, the index is not consistently. I, road matters might be indexed as road matters in one, and they might be under highways in another. So you, you don't know always where to look, and they're not consistent how to do the index. So I find the order books very challenging to use, but I do know that like when you're doing pension records for Revolutionary War people, yes, they're very helpful. The, the minute books are very helpful, something like that. Okay, um, she does agree that the indexes are not good. <laughs> um, and she does mention her early Latin order and minute books and that they're much more detailed. And those are very helpful and we use them often along with Louisa Hutchison's wonderful um, apprentices, bastards and poor children. Um, very helpful. Um, there was a question that popped up about the meaning of T, T-E-E -E in documents, but I can't find it again, so it may have gone straight to you, um, which, in, in which case, if you sent questions directly to when, um, we will perhaps maybe um, follow up with you after the class, because I can't see. I, I think uh, if there was a reference to T-E-E, -E, that's probably an abbreviation of trustee. Trustee. Okay. So, so in a deed of trust, there's a trustee. So that's probably what that TEE -E is an abbreviation of trustee. Uh, I was thinking I had a reference, I guess, in one of my lists to et all. I don't know if y'all know what that means, but it means and others. So if there's multiple people's names in a in a legal document, sometimes they'll list just the first name and then say et all, meaning all the other names in the document. Have you come across a resource that is a handy um, dictionary of legal terms? I know you defined some at the beginning of, of your uh, class, but do, do you... I, I think the definition that I used for those uh, legal terms originally, I pulled out of this real estate book. Uh, there are legal dictionaries out there that, that define legal terms. So uh, again, the, the what I pointed out from the class, I'm not a lawyer, or was I ever a lawyer? I wasn't an auditor, but I'm willing to admit that. But anyway, the, uh, <laughs> the uh, I, I'm not expecting y'all to be lawyers or to have the knowledge of a lawyer. What I'm trying to do is relate to you enough of the common terms that it doesn't throw you when you look at a document. One of the things, I, when I show people deeds here on the microfilm at the library, I'll pull one up on the thing and they'll try to read it and uh, struggle with that. And there's a lot of legalistic terms in it. But I said, well, I don't even read the whole document through. I just jump ahead to the points I'm interested in. You know, is, does it say bargain and sale? Does it say how many acres it is or where the property is located? You know, who's buying it, who's selling it, when was it? Because one big thing about deeds that I didn't talk about is the date that a document is written and a date that it's recorded. And I have seen documents in the deed books, uh, I'll give you a good example, where I've seen three different deeds in three different books that all are dated the exact same date. So Henry Smith is selling 30 acres to this number one, he sold 60 acres to number two, and he sold 30 more acres to number three. And they're recorded in three different deed books, but they all have the exact same date of the deed, but they were recorded three different times. And I said, historically, people quite often sold their property uh, in installment payments. 
So you would pay for the installment and the person would hold your deed and wouldn't record it until you had paid it in full. So that's why that happens that I've got three deeds written the exact same day. They're recorded in three different books because the people didn't get their deed recorded until it was finally paid in full, which varied as to when that occurred. So, so yes, there is a difference in between the written date of the deed and the date of the recording. I usually just deal with the written date and don't deal with the recorded date, but there is a, a, disparate, a big difference there. And one of the things that people talk about is uh, when you record a deed in the courthouse, that is for the safety of the buyer. All right. By recording the deed, somebody knows legally that I own the property. But if you sell me a piece of land and the deed's never recorded, I still have a legal deed for that parcel. The only problem is a subsequent buyer, if that guy chose to sell a second time, wouldn't know that because I never recorded my deed. So the, the safety of me is protected by recording my deed, but I still have a legal deed. I still legally own the land, whether I record it or not. All right. Sounds good. Um, so, oh, let's see. Because there are unrecorded deeds, and uh, one of the things they haven't allowed, and I don't know if Pat extracted that or not, was the unproven deeds and wills. We do have they, a book that I believe is by Pat, they, unproven they, deeds. They have unproven deeds and will book in the courthouse, and that is not unusual to allow them. There are other clerk's offices have that same issue. And what happened with some of these documents was if it didn't have certain legal uh, conditions met in the document, the clerk wouldn't necessarily record it. You would submit it for recording. And when the clerk looks at it, he say, wait a minute, this didn't have this or that on it. And so I'm not going to record it because it doesn't meet legal standards. And she, she points out it's partially proven deeds and there is a book on it. Okay. So thank you, Pat, <laughs> for attending the class and being very helpful. Um, so we also had a plug for Black's Law Dictionary, uh, which they say that, okay. uh, I've, I've heard it, if I don't know how to use it. Yeah, there's like a fourth edition, but an earlier one together. And we do have that here at the library. Um, and we have a couple versions of it because they, they do have different terms. Um, and then just uh, some very nice comments. Uh, thanking you for the class and for the wonderful information. Um, somebody mentions that they're researching Frederick County, Maryland. So I want to put in a plug. Uh, later this year, we'll have a course by Travis Shaw, who works here at the library about Maryland land records. And I have taken Travis's class and I thought it was excellent. But the thing that really struck me was that Maryland's records for the whole state are available online, as opposed to Virginia's where they're considered the property of the elected official, the clerk of the circuit court. And so they could put them online if they wanted to in Loudoun County. But if they put them online, they couldn't charge you a fee to look at them, nor could they charge you a fee to have copies made that you could print them off on your own computer. So Virginia is not as advanced in this thinking as Maryland is, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I do, I do find that, that um, records laws uh, vary greatly from state to state, and it depends on how much money they, they may or may not make off of them. But um, thank you for, for all of this excellent information. Uh, any last thoughts you want to add? No, I, I've talked so much, I can't remember what I said and didn't say, so I, I'm not sure. I, I think, though, there were some questions about getting started and all that. Again, I think that you need to focus on why or what you're trying to learn. And that's going to drive your decisions as to how you go about it. So whether you want to take off the time and go down to the courthouse and start doing the research, whether it be in Montgomery County, Virginia, or Loudoun, or whether you want to try to find somebody in that jurisdiction that will do some research for you, you know, or whether you want to use published index like Pat's books, to try to look for things because there's a lot of ways to go about this and some are much more time consuming and much more challenging than others. And so I think you have to look at it as to what you're trying to gain from the process and how much you're willing to put into it. Good advice. Very good advice.
Um, and there are people who are happy to help, uh, library staff, clerk, clerk support, um, employees of historic records departments. Uh, I think generally people who work with these materials are happy to help you in most cases. <laughs> Maybe not all of them, but mostly. I know we are here at the Bosch Library and we're very happy to have um, Wint's books and occasionally Wint's kindness to help us. And he's always very thoughtful and helpful with his, his information. So thank you very much for attending the class today. And thank you, Wen, for sharing the benefit of your experience and your knowledge. And um, also everyone with the great questions. And thank you very much for dealing with our, our uh, many, many technical difficulties and going on this journey with us. Um, hopefully you, you got um, most of the class content and we will be posting the video. I do think it actually recorded. Um, and we'll send out uh, Wynn's slides as handouts, as well as I'll do a list of all the books that we've mentioned. So you have that handy and you can look for them. I think everything you talked about, except for the real estate book and the title examination book that you- Was in my list, yes. Are there others in your list? Okay. Yeah, all the others are in my list. Okay, um, I think they're all also available here at the library. So- um, Well, I, I intended that. That's so right, I, I, wanted, I wanted people to be able to use the library. <laughs> Excellent. I didn't put the catalogs down. I didn't put the call number. <laughs> um, and for people who are elsewhere, I will say that many of these books are available um, not from us through Interlibrary Loan, but generally through the Interlibrary Loan system. Um, or you can always contact us here at the Balch Library, and we're happy to look up references for you in the book. We cannot provide full copies of um, books, sadly. <laughs> but we are always happy to look up specific index records and things like that. Um, but thank you very much for attending the class, and we hope you'll join us again soon for another program. Have a great afternoon. Thanks so much, Wayne.